And so, my dear brothers, for me, fundamentally, a retreat is a time to pray, a time to meditate, a time to reflect. Primarily, it is a time to listen. Listen very intensely to the Lord who is speaking within me. What is the Lord trying to say to me now? It doesn't matter how many years I have been living religious life, for me as a redemptorist, for you as a Catholic. But the Lord is speaking to me today. What is he trying to say to me? Do I want to know what areas in my life need changing, need healing? And if I should come to see these areas that need changing, that need healing, then the question is, do I want to change? Do I want to be healed? It's one thing to see what needs to be changed. It's another thing to want it. In John chapter 5 verse 6, Jesus asks the lame man, Do you want to be healed? It's important because if he wants to be healed, his life will change. Right now, he's laying, he's sitting, he's begging, he doesn't have to work, some give him money, some give him food. He's actually living a life provided for. Now if he's healed, nobody's going to give him food and money, he has to work for it. Nobody's going to carry him around. His life is going to change. Different from the way it was. Does he want that? That's what Jesus asks. The same question that is asked to me. Do I really want the Lord to transform me, to change me, to heal me, knowing that this would have consequences for my life, for the way I've been living? Another image I place before you is from the book of Genesis, chapter 33, verses 23 to 32. It's a beautiful image that helps us to enter the spirit of a retreat. Jacob meets a stranger who is an angel. And the stranger invites Jacob into a wrestling match. But Jacob is tough, he's hardy, he's rough, he's a very good wrestler. And Jacob is winning. But at some point, the angel breaks Jacob's eye, and Jacob falls. At that moment, the angel says, no longer will you be Jacob, but your name will be Israel, which means God is the winner. God wins. In other words, from now on, it is God who will always win. In Jacob, in Israel's life. But for that to happen, something has to break. Something has to break. In a retreat, sometimes something has to break within me in order that God is the will. God's will, His way, His triumph. Something breaks. I don't think the Capuchin order would have happened if there was not a break. And that break took place in your history. <coughs> and see how this amazing order has flourished, blossomed. Mm -hmm. On the drive here, you know, I was amazed to come to know you have so many provinces in India mm -hmm. and so many Capuchins in India, uh, which is amazing. See the Fruition, God winning, but it happened because of a break. 
as painful as that break would have been in history. And that can happen in a retreat. Something within me needs to be broken so that God wins. What is that? Or perhaps an even stronger image from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 to 3. And I quote from the text. I know all about you. How you are reputed to be alive. And yet, you are dead. Wake up. Revive what little you have left. It is dying fast. So far I have failed to notice anything in the way you live that my God could possibly call for. Yet do you remember how eager you were when you first heard the message? Hold on to Repent. Very strong words from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. The call to wake up. I don't believe that we have reached that level of almost dead. But all the same, the call to wake up is important. And that's what happens in a retreat. My dear brothers, there are three important requisites for a good retreat. What are these? First, a deep longing, a deep hunger and thirst for God. Jesus in John 6.35 says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Or again in Psalm, 43, 1 to 2, which we pray so often, as the female deer longs for running streams, so my soul thirsts for you, my God, the God of my life. When can I enter and see the face of God? This hunger, this thirst, this longing for God. Without such a hunger and thirst for God, it would be almost impossible for me to hear him speak during this retreat. This whole ambience, this whole beautiful environment here uh, lends us or allows us or offers us the sense of the presence of God uh, that we come away to experience him and to express our longing for him over here. How deep is this hunger in you right now? This thirst to be refreshed, to be satisfied by God alone. The second important requisite for a good retreat is the help of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we can do very, very little. A constant cry from our lips during this retreat is for enlightenment, for strength, for guidance, every day during these days. Our need for the Holy Spirit is expressed beautifully in these two passages, very short, I read for you. Ezekiel 2, 1, Ezekiel 2, 1. And Yahweh said, I am going to speak to you. As he said these words, the Spirit came into me, made me stand up, and I heard him speak to me. Or again, in the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 26. 8, 26. The Spirit comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how we ought to pray. It's the Spirit Himself that pleads with God for us in groans too deep for words. We do not know how to pray. And it's amazing that our morning prayer always begins, Oh Lord, open my lips. That's the cry to the Spirit to open our lips. 
And every moment of prayer, we pray, Oh God, come to my assistance. Oh Lord, make haste to help me. That's the call to the Holy Spirit. Following the instruction of Paul in the letter to the Romans, we cannot pray but for the Spirit. There are many things we do not know, my dear brothers. And we do not know how to make a successful retreat. Neither does the retreat animator, in this case myself, know how to give a good retreat because only the Spirit touches the hearts of the retreaters. The retreat animator or master proclaims God's word. You listen, but it's the Spirit that enables those words to move from your mind to your heart and eventually to your life. That's the work of the Spirit. Only when we are open to the Spirit, every day, every moment of this day, will God's Word come and bear fruit. There's a beautiful um, citation about the necessity of the Holy Spirit from a homily for Pentecost Sunday given by the former, going back a bit, uh, patriarch of the Eastern Church, Athenagoras. He was the patriarch at the time of Vatican II. And he went to Vatican II. He was the man who Paul, who Paul VI embraced. It was a great meeting of East and West. This is what he had to say. Without the Holy Spirit, God is far away. Christ stays in the past. The Gospel is a dead letter. The Church is only an organization. Authority is a matter of domination. Mission is mere propaganda. And the liturgy is just ritual. And Christian living is a slavish morality. But with the Holy Spirit, the whole cosmos, the universe is resurrected and groans with the pangs of new birth for the kingdom. The risen Christ is here. The gospel becomes the power of life. The church manifests the life of the Trinity. Authority is true service. Mission is a Pentecost. The liturgy is both memorial and anticipation. And human action is made divine with the Holy Spirit. I think only in the East can we get something so profound and deep. Uh, we in the West, the Latin Church, unfortunately lost that filioque controversy, you know, the centrality of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Church. Thanks be to God, to Vatican II, we are retracing our steps. So we need the Spirit of God constantly during these days. And the third requisite for a good retreat is prayer. We had a scripture professor who was an Irishman. Um, the Irish fathers started the Indian province. And uh, he would always say to us, and I remember, in fact, it was not very far from here when I made my retreat uh, for preparation for diaconate at the Benedictines here in Kingery. And he was preaching that retreat to us. Uh, Father Sean from Keller was his name. And he said to us, who are about to be ordained deeds, he said, from now on you will be preaching. You will be empowered to preach. And soon you will be preaching retreats, giving talks, but many retreats. But remember one thing, he said. At the end of your retreat, in all likelihood, no matter how good your talks are, 
your points are, your anecdotes and stories are, your retreatants will forget all that. But the only thing they might remember is how much time you gave them for bread. I never understood that. When he said this as a young, final year, almost finishing his theology, ready to die. But as the year has been by, I have treasured those words of Father Sean. In fact, when I make my own annual retreat, the power of that retreat is how much time I spend in prayer. Before the Lord, with the Lord. And if at all this transformation that it is to happen becomes as a result of that. And so the same is true for us, my dear brothers, during this retreat. The question is, what shall we pray for? Let's go to St. Paul. I'll give you two simple quotations from Paul. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. St. Paul says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your heart, living within you as you trust him. May your roots go deep down into the soil of God's marvelous love, and may you be able to feel and understand, as all God's children should, how long, how wide, how deep, how high his love really is and experience his love for yourself. And so I pray that each of us, my dear brothers, during these days, this prayer of St. Paul might come alive for us. That each of us experience, even now, doesn't matter how many years I am in religious life, that even now I keep experiencing deeply that I am loved, and loved specially by the Lord. And how amazing that love is for me, for you. Or again, using the same image St. Paul says in Colossians 2, 7, let your roots grow deep into him and draw nourishment from him. Powerful image. Let your roots grow deep into him and draw nourishment from him. See that you go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth you were told. That's an amazing prayer Paul had for his church in college. And I believe that prayer is very, very relevant for you and for me today. Every retreat, I believe, needs a little theme that enables us to focus. And so I choose a simple theme for our retreat for these days, my dear brothers. And the theme is our way of following and imitating the Lord. Our way of following and imitating the Lord. Now, it's clear that all of us are called to follow the Lord. Every Christian, whether it's the Holy Father, cardinals, bishops, priests, deacons, you and I as religious men, religious women, married people, single people, everyone follows the Lord, but in their own unique way. You and I as religious, male religious, follow the Lord as male religious. And that's unique to us. Different from the way a diocesan follows the Lord, or different from the way our siblings, my sister and brother-in-law follow the Lord, or a single person. What is the difference for us, religious male? Well, to quote from Perfecta de Caritatis, number one, the document from Vatican II on religious life. 
It says that we religious follow the Lord more. Three. And we imitate him more nearly. So clearly, what is unique for us is this word more. We follow him more free. We imitate him more nearly. In other words, there is a radicalism, a totality when it comes to religious. Nothing or no one is more important than the Lord for us. St. Paul expresses this beautifully. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 9, he says, I reckon everything as complete loss for the sake of what is much more valuable, the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have thrown everything away. I consider it all garbage so that I might gain Christ and be completely united with him. So therefore, my dear brothers, a retreat from this point of view is a time to examine myself.
says it doesn't. Not even the gospel or the church. I just so well. Is contraception bad? Ah, the answer people will give today is it depends. It depends on who. They're not going to say that. It depends on me. How I be? How I be? Is corruption bad? Oh, it depends. Is euthanasia, abortion, is taking a bribe, is giving a bribe, is watching porn, anything, anything. Relatives. It's creeped in to the church, it's creeped in into diocesan way of life, and it's creeped in to religious way of life. It's very, very frightening. Because it's the new normal. And the Holy Father sees this as a poison. And he calls on us, religious, to show the difference that no, nothing replaces the gospel. Nothing. Everything is relative to the gospel. The gospel. The second major challenge, crisis, the Holy Father indicated was superficiality. Superficiality is doing the minimum. Doing the minimum. The exact opposite of what St. Paul says, or what Perfecta de Caritas says, that more, that total giving. Or, so for us in religious life, or in the exercise of priestly ministry, what is superficiality? Well, I'm marked for confessions on Saturday from 6 to 6.30. I'll sit for 6 to 6.30. That's all. Somebody comes on Wednesday, sorry, come on Saturday, 6 to 6.30. Sorry, my office timings, 9 to 10. We will reflect on this Holy Father. This Holy Father is saying, there are no office nights. You have to be available for your people. You've got to be there for them. That's what you're obeying for. Don't be sitting in your arms. But superficiality is saying, well, I've done the minimum. I've done what I've been asked to do. And this is not a problem only for the diocesan clergy. It's creeped into our way of life as male religion. And we see this again and again, perhaps in the way we live our community life, our fraternal life. Well, that's not my job. It's his job. Why should I take care of the house? It's the guardian, you don't call guardian, we call right at all. It's not my job. But whose house is I can go one example after another. No, we do the minimum. We say, well, we're keeping the rule. I've done my job. That's not my job. Unfortunately, that's not what the gospel called. The third problem or challenge or poison the Holy Father indicated was what he called, and using his language, apparent security. In other words, he says that we tend to find our security in that which is just transitory. It seems to give us security, but actually it doesn't. And he mentioned a few things. He said, some of us are running after office, as if to say the office is going to give us security. Oh, and he mentioned, he said, you want to be secretaries in the gastries in Rome, you want to be on seniors, you want to be whatever. Titles was another thing. Then he said, your administrative position. And in religious life, 
I have seen this again and again. I want to be the director, I want to be head, I want to be manager, I want to be principal. As if to say, my meaning in life is coming from time, of the administration. Then he said gadgets, I'm using his language. He said gadgets, that our gadgets seem to give us security. They become extensions of our life, whatever the gadgets are. He used the cell phone and he used, I think he said, uh, iPads, that's what he used. He said, I said, we can't live without these. That our security comes from these. <laughs> and how true it is with us in religious life today. These are very practical, what the Holy Father says. And there is a crisis. And all of you, my dear brothers, are in the call to be animators in some way or the other. Provincial team, animators of your communities or of your institutions. And above all, of formation. And you will see this happen. Maybe among your co-brothers, maybe among your formandi, relativism, superficiality, apparent security. What is the way out? Well, the way out is simple. The way out is Franciscan. The way out is go back to God. That's the way out. Go back to what we are about. Living the gospel. And that's why this Holy Father chose his first major apostolic exhortation, Evangelicalium, the joy of the gospel. To live the gospel is joy. And that's what we are about. And so, the question to ask ourselves then, as we begin, how far is following the Lord number one in my life right now? Am I willing to walk behind him? Peter was getting distracted. James and John were getting distracted. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me. You don't tell me where to go. You follow me. Strong words from Jesus. But also challenged to us. And so many brothers, After making many retreats in your own life, you might be tempted to ask like the prophet Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14, Lord, can these dry bones come alive? Let me give you another analogy from the prophet Elijah. It's a beautiful image from the book of Kings, 1 Kings, 19, 9 to 15. You remember that incident, no? Elijah is running away from his enemies. He's the prophet, but he has upset people by preaching God's word. So they are all coming to kill him. And he's scared, he's running away. And he runs away and he hides in a mountainside in a cave. And he's waiting for God to save him. He's convinced God will come to speak to him. There's a thunder. No God. There's fire. No God. There's a mighty wind and earthquake. No God. And then there's a gentle breeze. And Elijah comes to the mouth of the cave and bows down. And it's at that moment he hears the voice of God. The voice of God is a simple question. Elijah, what are you doing here? A simple question. It's 
Sometimes in a retreat, that could happen to us. I'm not praying for thunder or lightning or earthquake or fire. Why? As we perhaps retreat into the cave of our lives, away from our ministry, our responsibilities, our work, our challenges, which could be suffocating us, troubling us, worrying us, frustrating us, like Elijah, we come away. Maybe the Lord could be asking us a question, whatever that question is. In the silence of our hearts, we are asked to respond. My dear brothers, as on the provincial mention, I have preached a few retreats over these many years. And I remember preaching a retreat many years ago to our redemptorist in Australia. And I've never forgotten this experience. At the end of the retreat, we normally have a redemptorist tradition, we have a happy hour. The retreat over celebration mass, and then in the evening we all before going to dinner, we'll have a drink together and just celebrate brotherhood. And uh, so we were celebrating the drink, and uh, an old brother in his 70s came to me and shared his father, that was excellent to greet. Um, I want to thank you. So I said, You're most welcome, brother. Thank you. And he said, This is the first time in all my life, father, I found the Word of God, the Scripture, so powerful. As if every text was speaking to me personally. I was like me. And then he said, that's the first thing I want to say thank you for. And second he said, again, this is the first time after years I could pray. And I feel good about it. Our Holy Father, Father Redemptorist in Alphonsus Liguori is the doctor of prayer in the church. That I could really pray the way St. Alphonsus asked us to. I felt so joyful listening to this elderly brother who was double my age at the time. Because they were two simple yet necessary aspects of our life. Prayer and the Word of God. And that's what the retreat is all about. To listen to God speaking in and through personal prayer. And I've learned from this experience all through that the most powerful way to hear God is through the scriptures. With all due respect, to even my own father who wrote 110 books. I don't take his books to a retreat. I don't take any book to a retreat. I only take the word of God. Because nothing replaces the gospel. Nothing. Because the gospel is the Lord speaking. The only rule for Francis was the gospel. That's it. You don't need anything else. The gospel. It's quite fascinating. Benedict tried. A lot of his um, Wednesday audiences for Benedict were on the gospel. And for Francis, is constantly on the gospel. Because the tragedy of Catholicism Yes, with Vatican II, we came back to the Word of God. But now suddenly, we're going away to all fascinating things. Revelations of a Polish nun are more important than the Gospel for some. With your due respect to this Polish nun, I have nothing against her. But as somebody said to me, What? Paul, how can you say that? God spoke to her. I said, Yeah, that's okay. But Revelation stopped here with the gospel. That's it. So, my dear brothers, nothing replaces the scriptures. The Lord is speaking to us through his word, and he will be these days. 
in letter to the Hebrews, the author says, chapter 4, verse 12, the word of God is something that is alive and can touch human hearts. The great Pope Gregory the Great once said, God directs his words to you. Learn to discover his heart in them. God directs his words to you. Learn to discover his heart in them. And so my prayer for each of us during these days, for you and for me, is that the Lord keeps speaking to us and that we open our hearts to listen to what he says to us. May your experience be that of that beautiful fresco of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel on the roof. Perhaps many of you have seen it. The creation of Adam, where the finger of God touches the finger of Adam on his face, and life is given to Adam. St. Augustine says those beautiful words, Lord, you have touched me, and see how I burn. Burn with love. May the Lord touch us as only He can during these days so that we might burn with His life and love. And so, as we come to pray this evening, I just leave you with that simple question I'm repeating. First question, go back to those three poisons or challenges or elements of the crisis in religious life that the Holy Father indicated. Relativism, superficiality, apparent security. That will help you go to the second question. Is Jesus my real priority, my number one? my true and only treasure right now is the following of Jesus everything for me as a redemptorist for you as a Catholic tribe. Naturally, in order to listen, I invite you into silence. Leave, I need to talk about this, but it's always good to remind ourselves that we cannot listen with noise. Uh, we cannot listen with chatter, and I know it's going to be challenging. Um, normally, uh, we begin a retreat after dinner so that at dinner you can relax and chat and, and catch up with one another because you will be seeing each other after a long time and you have. A lot of stories to tell each other and share with each other and talk about. Um, and so that's challenging. But all the same, given all of that, I still invite you into a silence for yourself and for one another. And God has blessed us with this amazing, beautiful uh, ambiance uh, for prayer, for silence, for reflection, for retreat. Um, to whom much is given, much is expected of. And today's gospel of the talents, I think we have been blessed uh, to be here in this peace and quiet. May we use this um, to listen to the Lord. So I invite you into a deep silence, as I said. Rest will revive all of us to be relaxed in the presence of the love of God. So when we go to pray now, um, just simple, we will expose the blessed sign and we'll sit quietly in adoration. I may just give a little recap, a few points, and then we just sit in quiet silence before the Lord, the sacrament, and then maybe at about uh, 22 to 8, we will pray our evening prayer and close with benediction.